uh, a great reminder that um, we all have the tool that is our breath with us anytime and to, to, to tune into that is, um, is, uh, is powerful. Um, thank you for doing that. And maybe as we start off this conversation, Michael, um, I have to say, I don't think I've ever let a, um, or been part of a conversation like this just seconds after opening my eyes for my meditation. So we're like, we're in the zone here. Um, tell us a little bit about your meditation practice and um, both personally and at the company Calm. Um, so what is your practice like sort of daily, weekly, monthly? And then are you still having the whole company meditate for 10 minutes a day in the morning, uh, every day of the week? We do, yes, good, uh, good memory. We, we start um, the day pre-COVID, we used to start the day with a, a 10 minute daily calm meditation. And we still do that remotely with the team all around the world. And I think it's just a, a lovely part of our culture where everyone comes together. But in, in terms of my story, I think, you know, it's the classical entrepreneurial tale of scratching my own itch. <laughs> um, and I think one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this is, is because like a lot of people, I've come from a place of being quite skeptical of meditation and, and mindfulness. I, I, for years, thought it was a bit woo-woo and, and weird. I didn't fully understand it. I thought it had major religious connotations. Um, and there's a very long story, but I'll, I'll give you the short condensed version. My previous company was growing very rapidly um, at millions of users. Uh, hundreds of millions in revenue. And, and then almost overnight, it was a kids entertainment company, kind of the, 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 uh, the we were hot one minute and, and not the next. And we had to let a lot of people go, revenues collapsed, and it was an incredibly stressful, difficult time. And I went away and uh, I began trying to practice meditation. And I read a lot of books and research papers and, and this light bulb went on in my head that, as I say, this is, this is not weird and woo woo, this is neuroscience. This is a way of, of rewiring the, the human brain to help us show up in the world better, to increase our awareness, um, to allow us to, to be more mindful instead of mindless. And it's improved my sleep, it's improved my relationships, it's improved the way I work, it's it's improved my joy and my happiness. And, and, so and Michael, and, yeah. and what does that what does that mean? So what, what does the practice look like for you? Like what are you what are you physically doing and on what cadence? So I think one of the, the fears I had and a lot of people do about meditation is that you need to really commit and do this for hours uh, at a time. And uh, you have to sit in a certain way and dress in a certain way. But we believe at Calm, we wanted to make it as simple and accessible. So for, for me and, and the core of Calm, it's 10 minutes every morning. Um, and we created uh, the Daily Calm with Tamara, which is a, a meditation practice, but with a new story and a new lesson that, that makes it uh, something uh, to look forward to every day. So you do your own, the done 10 minute calm. So if, if you do the 10 minute calm meditation every day, put it in the chat, just type into the chat right now. Are you on the 10 minute a day? I know Anne Duane's on this. Uh, who else is doing the calm daily meditation? Type it into the chat, let's see. And if you're not doing the calm, if you have a, me a meditation practice, just type it in for a few words. Like, what do you, uh, what's your practice like? Like daily, sit, weekly, you just get learning about it. Maybe you don't have a practice yet. I think one of the- Elizabeth the, sleep stories, I like it. Okay, a few times uh -huh. a week. Headspace for 20 minutes. Garrett uh -huh. Smiley, you're kicked off the Zoom. <laughs> Sorry, thanks for, thanks for playing. Um, Wanting to learn more. Okay, yeah. Um, quick five minute resets from Diego. Uh, awesome. Um, so, so Michael, you do t 10 minutes a day and uh, right when you wake up or later in the day or what's, what, when does it happen for you? It's, it's usually, uh, I think, anchoring it with something that you do every day uh, is valuable. So I usually do it after I've had a shower and I've got dressed. And then definitely before I've turned my phone on and dived into the world of, of Twitter and uh, news. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's just, yeah, a lovely, calm, easy start to and, the day. And, and, and so so many people are trying, and some people here with us on, on this call, you know, want to be doing it more, want to establish it as a habit, and they struggle to make it a habit. Um, what, what tips or advice do you have for people who have long had the intention that have had a hard time following through? Yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know, like anything that's, that's valuable and, and can transform us, uh, we have to kind of put the, the work in it. It doesn't happen overnight. 
Um, so one of the things, as I say, is don't uh, beat yourself too much up about it. Don't think you have to do it for, for hours. Um, try and anchor it with something else you're doing every day so it, it, it becomes more of a habit. And, and this was one of the step changes we saw at Calm when we introduced the daily Calm. So sitting on your own and clearing your mind and, and attempting to meditate is not easy. But when you have um, a teacher or an app giving you something new every day, kind of to hold your hand and, and lead you through it. And again, end with something inspirational, or motivational, or, or something valuable to learn. I think that makes a massive difference. And yep. to know you're part of a big community as well of, of other people around the world doing it. Oh yeah, I think that's what you do so well with Calm is that sense of community with others. I, I think the people who are the best, interestingly, within the meditation community of all the different practices that I've been exposed to, people that do transcendental meditation seem to be the most uh reliable at following through in the twice a day and it's just it's funny how tm has has um has engaged people in that way for me for what it's worth for folks who are struggling with the daily practice i've been meditating for um you know probably a decade pretty seriously but i've always struggled with the daily habit um mm -hmm. and one of the things i've talked with uh, talked to about with uh with bob wright who wrote a great book called why buddhism is true if anyone is interested in it and the evolutionary psychology meets buddhism is I've, and I've argued with Bob because I said the uh, a regular meditation retreat practice can also be very powerful. So if you go on retreat every six or 12 months, uh, that's sort of a different way of exploring this practice. So even if you meditate once every two or three weeks uh, for 10 minutes, but then do sort of a 10 day deep dive, that has, it's a very different way of approaching meditation. But if, so if you've been struggling with a daily practice and you haven't yet done a silent retreat, uh, I would highly recommend trying a three, five, 10 day retreat um, and see how that experience. And if you do that once every year, that can expose a lot of the benefits of meditation in a sort of different structure. Um, hey, uh, Raymond, I wanted just to introduce one of our founders, uh, Michael. Uh, Raymond, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask about uh, religion and meditation? Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I was just- um, Could you introduce yourself too for the, for the villagers who don't know you? Yeah, I'm Raymond Rofe, uh, I'm CEO of, of PAVE. Um, yeah, I guess my question here is, you were just talking about community and retreats, and so I was wondering about uh, the role of religion has played in, in the ideation of calm and like in figuring out those meditation practices in, themselves. Yes, so, you know, we, we base the teaching at calm on, on Vipassana, and, you know, there's a long history of, of meditation, thousands of years, and, and many of the major religions have um, meditation practices kind of woven into, into their structures. And one thing we very consciously wanted to do is we wanted to, to keep our teachings authentic and, and valuable, but we didn't want to lean on religion. I think one of the, the reasons a lot of people have been wary of um, meditation in the West is because they assume it, it has major religious connotations. It's, it's why it's been difficult to bring into schools. It's, it's caused a lot of um, hesitation. So we wanted to create the practice more, more secular, more, um, more kind of accessible and simple and, and relatable to, to folks um, uh, without connecting it to religion. And, and Raymond, you said in the chat you do prayer twice a day. So what kind of prayer do you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm Muslim. Um, you know, we, we've been prescribed five times a day, but I, I stick to two. <laughs> and so, right, so that uh, doesn't leave this room. That does not leave this room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is only within the village right here, twice a day instead of five exactly. times. Yeah. So yeah, I just do yeah, something in the morning and then something um, before bed. And, uh, okay, got it. And, and there's a lot of, I saw Gil uh, in the chat talking about twice a day. I think he has a Jewish um, sort of meditation practice, obviously with Christian mystics. There's a lot of ways to have religion be connected to a meditation practice, but it can also be a, a, quite a secular undertaking as well. And Michael, you know, you've built the most, you know, the number one, meditation and mental health app in the world. And I think you've done so with a sort of secular approach to have the broadest possible appeal, um, uh, which, which, which makes sense. Um, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the early days then of Calm and how you acquire, because you know, in addition to this being a fascinating topic in meditation, this group of people here uh, are all entrepreneurs and angel investors and, and, um, and you've done an extraordinary job in a really crowded space um, building the number one brand, the number one app. And so how did you acquire, like, what was that first year of Calm look like? What was that initial vision? Because today, you know, you're doing deals with LeBron and you're in Hollywood and you're, you know, trying to build the Nike of mental fitness. But in the early days, 
what was that initial vision and, and how did you acquire users and get people to, to use Calm over Headspace or, or Insight Time or any other competitors in the market? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. It's very crowded at the moment, but it, it certainly wasn't back seven years ago when we, we started the journey. And people thought we were a little bit crazy. You know, they'd back away from us at parties if we said we were launching a meditation app. They assumed it was a not-profit. Investors we spoke to said, this is ridiculous. No one will pay for this or you can get it free on YouTube and elsewhere. So it was very, very difficult. But Alex Chu, my co-founder, and I had a really strong thesis and conviction that uh, this was going to shift. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you look for these huge societal shifts that take place uh, where collectively we, we change our opinion on something. And we felt that was coming for, for meditation and mindfulness and mental health in general. We just couldn't believe that you know, mental health had so much stigma associated with it. And we thought what was gonna happen was similar to what Phil Knight had managed to do at Nike 50 years ago. You know, I'm sure everyone, many people have read his book, Shoe Dog. And in the early days of Nike, you know, no one went jogging, gyms weren't really a thing, no one kind of got it, and now they've, they've built a huge business there. And we felt the same thing was going to happen with, with mental wellness. So uh, that was the very strong conviction. Alex, my co-founder, as I say, mentioned to me that he found a brilliant domain name, um, calm.com. Uh, how, much, how much did that cost you? Have you, have you disclosed that? We don't often talk about it, but I'll, I'll, share, I'll share with the group. So... Um, uh, I was like, that is an amazing domain. We could build one of the world's greatest brands. And I said, how much does the guy want? He wants a million dollars. And I'm like, no way. Neither of us had anywhere near that kind of money. So we like didn't think much of it for about a year. And then he came back to us and said, look, uh, are you interested? Make me an offer. So we actually were able to buy it for about a hundred, a little over a hundred thousand dollars, which is still a lot of money. Holy Toledo. That's an amazing deal. Yeah. But um, we actually, because that was the most money I'd ever spent on anything in my life, um, we actually said to him that, could we give him 5% of, of Calm? We're going to build this huge business. Uh, and he laughed at us and said, don't be so ridiculous. But you know, that, that would be worth $100 million now. So I think he's a bit frustrated. Well, <laughs> yes, that's the, that reminds me of the, the guy that painted the mural at Facebook HQ. You ever see that story? Like he, yeah. instead of paying cash, he took Facebook equity. Um, he, he, did, he did the right thing. Yeah, that. he did the right thing. Uh, <laughs> he hasn't been doing much painting anymore uh, since making that, that, off, that deal. Okay, so you bought the Calm domain. I mean, I know lots of entrepreneurs that, I mean, honest to God, they, they discover a domain that's available and they work backwards to figure out what business to build behind that domain. Now, this is a little bit more web 1.0. Domains don't matter as much in a mobile app world, but you know, five to 10 years ago, so you bought calm.com for $100,000. Was that, and you didn't have a business incorporated then? You, you literally, that was the first, first was part of the process. That the first thing. We'd done a lot of talking about it, um, but that was the kind of the first major thing, the major bet we made. And so, did you have a company about, incorporated? Had you raised money or this was just, you guys personally put up 100K to get the domain and then you went from there? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty much the first thing we did. As we were setting the company up, we hadn't raised any money. Um, I'd had this money earmarked to put a deposit on a house, uh, and um, <laughs> my parents, my parents thought I was absolutely <laughs> mad, as you can imagine, getting a you know a certificate for a, a domain instead of bricks and mortar. But um, in hindsight, it was the right thing to do. And, and some of the angels we started to to talk to were super impressed. You know, Jason Calacanis in particular, that we we wow, we were all in by <laughs> by making a, a ballsy move like that. And I, even at that point, I hadn't fully understood how important meditation was going to play in what we were doing. I just felt calm could be like a Virgin or a Disney or a, you know, a Nike of, of just helping people relax. Just as a, as a side note, if, if you've ever purchased a domain for more than, say, $500, type it into the chat. Um, what's the most expensive domain name you've ever uh, purchased? And if you, if you can share what the word is that, you, that you're sitting on, I'd be sort of curious. Um, this is, we all own, or many of us who have been entrepreneurs, you know, I've got like 60 domains in my GoDaddy uh, for all these ideas that I'm sure I'll never pursue. 50K, what, what, care. wow. What's your best domain? I don't Honestly. have any good ones. I don't have any good ones. I have niche domains for business ideas that I'll probably never pursue. Uh, Kin.com for 300K, Shield. Wow. Wow. Breakthrough.com is pretty good. Military.com, and you paid an equity, they, 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 they got equity to the, the seller. Wow. Um, carbon .co. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. Sahadak.com. Um, okay, so so okay, so you buy you buy the calm. And I remember getting Jason Calcanis's email saying, 
I just invested in this thing and the domain's amazing. Like that was, that was basically the, <laughs> that was basically the opening. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not crazy because I think for these consumer, for these consumer uh, brands, um, that's really powerful. Okay. So then what happened? Like you had zero use, all you had is a domain and no house. So you're still in some studio <laughs> apartment in the Tenderloin and well, <laughs> we, we were actually in the UK. Alex and I were living in London in Soho, um, which is like the, the, the dirty beating heart of London. Um, we love it. And we used to play Xbox FIFA every night talking about business ideas. So that's where it, it kind of got hatched. So living in this rented house and Alex is a, is a genius with um, viral ideas. So one of the signals that told us that there was something here was a, a website that he had cobbled together just before this called um, do nothing for two minutes.com, which is it's not quite as catchy as calm.com, but um, it was beautiful waves on a beach and you literally just had to sit and look at the screen and not touch your mouse or keyboard for two minutes. And it sounds easy, but people <laughs> couldn't do it. They really, really struggled. And if you got to the end, it said, congratulations, give us your email address. Um, we'll tell you when this exciting new thing we're doing is launching. And we seeded it, Alex seeded it with a few folks and put it out on Twitter. And we got about 100,000 email addresses from that in a few weeks. So uh, that was like, wow, um, there's, something, there's something big here. People are looking, searching. I mean, that's an amazing, yeah, it's, a, it's such a great example of, you know, kind of is like the, uh, for anyone who's in the sort of book publisher world, you know, Tim Ferriss had, 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 uh, has tested all these different book title ideas using Google AdWords, like the sort of landing page to, to assess demand, uh, to assess click through. So that's, that's fantastic that you're able to have sort of a mini experiment that exposed this opportunity to some degree. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was definitely a strong signal. And I, I'm, we're huge believers, Alex and I, in, in obviously it, timing is so important. Choosing the right market to, to play in is absolutely critical. It doesn't matter how smart you are, or how much money you've got, if you're in a market with the wind in your face, so, um, so we spent a lot of time thinking and researching um, before we kind of really sort of went, went too deep into this, but we had this very strong sense that was something big. Okay, so you, so, so you have the, dom and, and sorry, was that before or after buying the domain? Uh, that was before the domain. Okay. That was okay, part so, of the, the thinking and research. Okay, so do, do nothing for two minutes.com, which I guess still exists according to our own Sam Kirshner in the chat, fascinating. <laughs> so you're on that site, you realize that, okay, so there's an opportunity to buy the domain, and then uh, did you go raise money or did you have, did you release like an alpha of the product? What was the process like? Yeah, so there was a website initially that was just uh, relaxing um, waves at, at calm.com. There was no monetization. It was just, and people would share it and they'd had these waves on in the background while they were working. So steadily, organically, it was growing a little bit, but um, we thought apps could be an interesting route. So that's when we started to experiment sort of around 2013 um, to, to put that together. Alex moved over to San Francisco before me. I was still with my previous business kind of um, bringing in a new CEO. And uh, we thought Silicon Valley would be the best place to, to base ourselves. A, because we thought it would be easier to raise money and B, because we thought an idea like this would be more likely to, to be well received in the kind of the creative, open-minded California um, environment. Okay. And, 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 um, and let's actually continue talking a little about your fundraise and we'll come back. I want to ask some questions about some mental health space and, 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 and the product more generally, but so, so you move, so, so Alex is in the Bay area, you eventually follow, how much money did you raise in your, in your seed or what was your process like? Yeah. So we did, um, we found it very, very difficult to, to raise money. Um, we got lucky with a few folks that knew us from previous ventures. We had done, you know, as I say, I created this world called Moshi Monsters. Alex was the guy that created the million dollar homepage, um, which some internet historians- Alex created about. the million dollar homepage? Holy shit. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the internet, that's legend status. Exactly. If people don't know what this is, we can, we can put it in the chat, but yeah, that's, that's amazing. It was extraordinary. Yeah, he did that as a broke student in about 2005. So he definitely had a lot of folks that like, wow, he, he knows what he's doing. So that helped um, get a few early angels. But we did, I think the first little round we did was about, um, I think about $450,000. And then over the first sort of year and a half, we did three rounds. So we raised a, a total of about one, just under $1.5 million in, in convertible notes. And then nothing, we had to use that capital. We weren't able to raise money again for many, many years because uh, we just couldn't do a series A for, for love or money. 
so so people so so and um so so you couldn't convince investors to put more money into the company because what they were skeptical that meditation or wellness was a billion dollar category were you not seeing traction with the app yeah i think it was a few we were seeing traction i think we we so in terms of how it grew the organic was amazing um we got to about eight million downloads before spending a penny on marketing so people were were, were using it and and liking it um, we had started monetizing it, so we were making a bit of money. But I, the investors we spoke to, just meditation wasn't really a thing then. There was just a lot of skepticism. Mental health was still not really talked about. Um, I think people thought it was a bit faddish. I don't think we told our story particularly well. Um, I think people were looking at us as how big could meditation really get when, in fact, we should have been saying we're playing in the $4.2 trillion health and wellness category and we're going to be the market leader. So um, I think we learned some, some lessons there, but we had many, many, many no's over many years and had no choice but to just hunker down, make sure we were profitable, watch every single dollar we spent. Um, we had to get very creative with how we raised money. So we actually, um, when we were down to our last few thousand dollars, um, we did a book deal to keep the lights on. So we sold the rights to a calm book to Penguin um, for about $100,000. And, uh, and that was hugely important cash that kept us going. That's, that's amazing. I, that's, that's what it reminds me of like the Airbnb selling cereal, um, <laughs> you know, story. It's like uh, whatever it takes to stay alive. So, I mean, this is such an under, I mean, this is classic uh, Silicon Valley in a sense of we forget about all of the struggles and challenges. Like today, y'all are always in the headlines for building this, you know, billion dollar plus business and the number one app, but all of the years of struggle and the no's and the rejection, I mean, um, it must've been hard emotionally just to stick with it and persevere. So how did you, how did you maintain the confidence that you were onto something, even if everyone else thought you were, you were crazy? Yeah, good question. I think there were moments when we, we were doubting ourselves and like, you know, is, is this really the right thing to be doing? Um, maybe the world will never wake up to this. Uh, but I think that's the beauty of having a co-founder that, you know, whenever either of us would have a little dip, we G the other one along and keep going. We had a very small team, very passionate team of about six of us um, who all believed in this crowded around a tiny um, uh, co-working space on Harrison Street in San Francisco. So we kind of just pulled ourselves along. And then it was sort of um, early 2017 where it, things really started to, to shift and change. And that was when society started waking up to this and um, the, the, just the growth became uh, rock, hockey, hockey stick. Yeah, Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, is also a good book in this topic. He said, it's waking up. Um, and and so, so sort of thinking about your fundraise, so all these investors don't get it, right? One of the lessons that you said, if you could go back and do it differently, is you would have framed the market in larger terms, right? You were, you were pitching a meditation app, and if yeah. you'd framed it as mental wellness or health and wellness more generally, that's a much larger sort of TAM that a VC can imagine. What yeah. other things would you do differently if you were going back and fundraising for Calm to knowing what you know today, either tactically and how you reached out to investors, or just strategically, what would you do differently? Yeah, it's, I think the biggest thing is probably the way we framed the story. We were certainly very passionate, but I think we were a bit too focused on, on the meditation rather than the broader space. Um, hard to know, I think just sometimes you'll, you know, the analogy of surfing and, 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 and business is, is a good one. You, you don't wanna to be too late to catch that wave. You don't wanna to be too early. And I think we were probably a little bit too, too early. Um, I think the other thing was that Headspace had raised quite a big round and they were seen as the market leaders. And so for even the people that got it and believed in it, they were like, this, this is sewn up. They're so far ahead of you. They've, they've raised a big round. They've got a hundred people. Um, this, it's going to be winner takes all. So yeah. It's a, it's a little dump in the Headspace in a second, but just to, just to sort of reiterate, I think it's such a core entrepreneurial tension when you're pitching investors, right? On the one hand, you're trying to paint this huge market. On the other hand, you're trying to imply that you're going to be focused and you have a wedge in, into a specific use case that you're starting with, right? And so, because yeah. you can also make the mistake of, of being overly expansive in the vision, right? And not seeming focused or niche enough. Um, and, and, and then there's another path, which is you focus on a niche, but you say this market's actually going to expand and grow, right? It's a market that doesn't exist yet. Ride sharing, for example, right? They're, they're, it's, it's, you, you don't know the market's going to exist, but it will, right? So there are a lot of ways to, to, to spin this, but I think... I, it sounds like for you, if you had painted the mental wellness picture generally and said meditation is the first four years of the business, but over the next 20 years, 
we're going to conquer all of mental health and wellness, that would have had perhaps more success. You know, I think you're absolutely right. There is that tension. And I think you've got to, to, to build anything incredible, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> and usually that's quite small and execute the hell out of it and make it the best in the world. But as you say, also educate the investors and, and paint that picture of if you can nail that and then nail stage two, how big is this TAM and, um, and how big could this become? So. And, so how, and so let's, and just to headspace, a lot of founders on this, on, on this call right now, Michael, you know, they, they have competition um, and they got asked about competition and here you are raising money for Calm as Headspace was already basically the number one app. And I remember Jeff Weiner and some other people, didn't they invest in Headspace? They had a sort of a, a, a yep. star studded group of, <laughs> of CEOs and executives backing Headspace. And so what's your, what was your pitch uh, to investors or to yourselves about how you're going to surpass them? And what actually was your growth uh, strategy and how did you surpass Headspace so considerably? Yeah, so I wish there was kind of one simple soundbite and silver bullet, but it, like anything, entrepreneurship is just a million small decisions compounded. Um, and uh, I think we did a lot of things well in aggregation. I think one of the biggest was... The, the, the fact we couldn't raise money made us very, very efficient and very, very nimble and, and thoughtful. And um, uh, so we had this kind of just, they had all this money, they were chasing a lot of shiny objects, they'd grown the team massively, 10x, what, 100x, what, 10x what our team was. So I think that focus helped us uh, hugely. Um, I think our, our branding is, is arguably more extensible, you know, calm rather than headspace. Um, uh, and so brand is extremely important. I think we were very, very sharp at the user acquisition. We hired a, a fantastic team there and built that muscle in-house very quickly and uh, grew. And, um, and, and, and just, to, just to jump, Michael, on the, on the, you didn't raise too much money. I mean, it was the blessing and the curse. I mean, today, this is sort of a different Silicon Valley today, right? We found there's so much venture money, there's so many angels, uh, and a lot of founders struggle with this question of how much to raise, especially if there's more demand from VCs than they are originally planning on. You know, should they just 2x their round size because, hey, the money's there and have a longer runway? Um, are you suggesting that one of the things that made you different from Headspace is they raised a lot more money more quickly in their journey, and, and whereas you all had to develop sort of habits of frugality and discipline that might have served you better long term? And if so, would your advice to the founders on this call be to be to be more conservative in the amount of money they raise? And how do you sort of balance that with the, the idea of wanting to have a runway and room to experiment and make mistakes? Yeah, I think it definitely helped us. It, it built those frugal muscles and made us very, very focused on, on a few small things. I think one of the most important things about entrepreneurship is, is, is focus. It was advice I had years ago in one of my first board meetings where I was sharing all these ridiculous, crazy creative ideas and an investor took me aside afterwards and said, Michael, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> I was like, what on earth are you talking about? But, but I totally the main thing is that. to keep the main thing the main thing. But the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing and just do that. And again, as I say, the power of focus and compounding, just getting better and better. Um, so that, that served us uh, very, very well. But it's a hard question to answer because I, I think depend, how much money you should raise kind of depends on the business you're building, the market you're in for consumer subscription. And this is why I love consumer subscription so much. You have very good um, cash flow. Uh, you have your consumers paying you annual subscriptions upfront. Uh, the cost of the creating the content is, is pretty small. So it, it, we don't need an awful lot of capital. And in our space, in our sector, too much capital could be dangerous because there's a million different things we could spend it on and, and uh, spin off. <laughs> And we're going to go to some questions. Amrit, uh, I'm going to go to you in a second for your question about mental health of direct reports. And, and Rachel, it's an interesting question in the chat. So we're going to open it up in a second. Michael, just to go back to uh, focus. You know, we all, it's, 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 it's one of those truths that, that no matter how many times you hear, hear someone say it, it's important to remind ourselves of it because as entrepreneurs, we, we can always have a million ideas. We have to stay focused. One, at the same time, there is a role sometimes for, for wide angle brainstorming and ideation and creativity. Uh, one way that I often see a plan on founding teams is there's one person that's a little bit more of the focused disciplinarian and the other who's a little bit more of the big thinking uh, creative. Now, call Matt, you actually have co-CEOs, which we won't probably have time to get into on this call. That's his own separate fascinating topic of whether that could exist. Um, yeah. 
uh, or how, how it exists so successfully in select cases like you and Workday and these other businesses that have co-CEOs. But do you and Alex complement each other in that regard? Like, are you more of the creative and he's more of the focused or are you both uh, similar and you have, you find the complementarity in someone else? Yeah, I think, you know, we've known each other for 15 years. It, that relationship is built deeply on trust and, and respect. And so co-CEOs doesn't always work, but it, it works extremely well with us. So we do have a lot of shared um, skills, but I think Alex is maybe a little more kind of product and engineering and operational focused. I'm a little bit more kind of um, marketing and, and content and crazy uh, long-term thinking. And so to your point, focus is incredibly important. That's what you do during the day, that kind of killer execution. But I think at night and in the evenings over a beer, um, that's when you can talk about the big crazy ideas. And so having a, a brilliant co-founder that can riff with on that is, is super useful. Yeah, and just as a matter of tactics, I find it's some of the, it can be really distracting when the crazy big idea brainstorming happens in the middle of a work day, like right after and before the day-to-day -day execution. So I always suggest to, to founders, uh, just allocate time each week, each month uh, to doing that big picture brainstorming and set some time aside for it so that you know it'll always be there. Um, and actually Eric Reese in a fireside chat that uh, he's an LP at Village and uh, a fireside chat we did with Eric Reese, he talked about this uh, to the pivot or persevere question that he talks about in Lean Startup mm. um, so that it doesn't become a daily conversation. Just schedule the pivot or persevere discussion on, I can't remember what he suggests, every three weeks, every six weeks, where the whole company is gonna get together and talk about, do we need to pivot or do we persevere? And outside of that scheduled time, don't talk about it. Like just stay focused on executing the mission, right? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a very, very good um, way of structuring it and thinking about it. Similar to the human mind, the rumination that a lot of people go through if they're struggling with anxiety or, or, or depression, getting caught in those constant loops answering the same question. A kind of a, a business can, can do that. And yeah, and actually, <laughs> and there's a similar, you know, it's a common advice given to people who struggle with anxiety uh, and obsession, obsessive thoughts, which is schedule time. Like if you're stressed about a relationship, give yourself permission between nine to 9.30 PM to do nothing but stress out about that. And then like put those thoughts in a box and we'll turn the lock and don't think about it again, but know that you'll have time to just totally obsess about something. But yeah. it's the every, every 60 minute, two minute obsession that's really damaging to mental health and productivity, arguably. Um, 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 Amri, can, uh, can you say hello and tr uh, turn on your video if it's not on and, uh, and ask your question? Thanks, Ben. Um, hey, Michael, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be on this video chat with you. Um, you know, my question, I, you know, just for reference, I'm a first time CEO founder uh, in that seed to series A type of stage of our business. It's a crazy time. Uh, coronavirus has, has offered, you know, all kinds of challenges to all of our personal lives. And uh, so mental health is clearly, you know, on my mind, especially for, for, for my team. Uh, as a first time founder, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm causing all kinds of mental health problems for my direct reports. Uh, unintentionally, of course, uh, are there things that you have learned over the years across your startups and, and your, you know, more recent focus on mental health that I can either watch out for to not do or to proactively do to, to encourage a, a healthy, a mentally healthy uh, uh, teamwork dynamic at work and, and, you know, for the benefit of my colleagues at home? Yeah, great, great question and a, a very important one. Important before the pandemic and, and even more important now. So the short answer would be to buy calm subscriptions for all your employees. <laughs> we'll do you a special discount. Our, our enterprise business is, is, is booming and very exciting. But joking aside, I think, um, you know, I, I've seen this firsthand. I, I was in my previous business very mindless about how I ran the company. I thought I had to be on 24 seven. I'd fall asleep with the phone glued to my face doing one last email. I'd wake up, it'd be the first thing I'd check. And that just energy you then bring to the office, that exhaustion, that franticness, people pick up on. That's not great leadership. Great leaders are calm <laughs> and they, well, no matter everyone else is running around in chaos, they, they have that really strong core. So um, developing a meditation practice is useful. Being very thoughtful about when you are online and, and when you are off, trying to have you know, maybe one day a week where you're not um, kind of working and, and responding to things. Uh, we gave the team, um, we've given the team a couple of mental health days off uh, this year. It felt quite expensive and scary to do because we've got a million things going on. 
but the reaction was amazing that the team really respected it and, and liked it and it helped um, look after your sleep, look after nutrition, what you put in your body, all these things that we kind of think, oh, as an entrepreneur, I don't have time for any of that. But taking one little step backwards to put all this in place allows you to, to run forward much, much more effectively and efficiently. The, uh, the best, you know, the, the, not the best, the definition of mindfulness that one of my teachers, Steve Armstrong, told me, which I always remember is remembering to recognize the present moment's experience. That's mm -hmm. what mindfulness is, remembering to recognize the present moment's experience. And um, Amrit, as, as, I, as I reflect on every founder's good intentions, there probably are, they probably are aware of when they're doing something that might be adverse to team members' emotional state or wellness, but they're not remembering to recognize what's happening in that moment. Um, and so I do think to, this is where meditation meets this topic, which is tuning in to that present moment can create the, ah, this is probably an unwise thing to say. Like, yeah. I, I personally believe it's less about new skills and more about remembering to recognize when you should employ the skills you already have, right? Uh, oh, this person probably needs a break. I'm probably pushing this person too hard, right? I probably should lay off for a few days. Or I need to give this person more positive feedback or negative feedback. We tend to know those things intuitively, but we forget to recognize them. And yeah. so it's, yeah. and so what's, it can meditation be a tool to sort of reground oneself in that moment. So for me, for example, it's like noticing the breath as it goes into the inner nostril and out the nostril, like where's that physical point on the body where you can recognize that and that brings you right into this moment. And then, yeah. then I'm more likely to remember the things I, I, I need to know to be a better you know, friend or, par or partner or husband, whatever. Well, well said. I think you know, one, um, one important thing here is that meditation, developing that practice allows you to respond instead of react to the stimulus, stimulus of life. I think for me, that's been it, the single biggest, most valuable uh, element of, of this practice. So we were hit with a million stimulus all the time. Someone cuts us up in traffic, someone says something stupid to us. And instead of just immediately the amygdala jumping back, you just have that fraction of a second more pause to respond in a, a more thoughtful way. And that makes all the difference. And I think a lot of leaders and CEOs have been hesitant to bringing mindfulness into their organizations because there was this sense that oh, the team are all going to chill out. No one's going to get any work done. Everyone's going to be singing Kumbaya on cushions in the corner of the office. And, and th that could not be less true. It, it's a way of sharpening your, your mental fitness, improving your mental health. It's, so, so, um, so Michael, as a, on, a, on a sort of a light note, um, and I can't tell because I think you have the virtual background, but you know, you, one of the things you're famous for is, is the bed head, the crazy hair, the wild hair. Are you, have you moved away from that? Because that was as much you as Steve Jobs' black turtleneck. Are you now brushing your hair? Well, um, I haven't cut my hair in ages. Um, I'm gonna, my hair looks a bit ridiculous. In, ah, that's the real life. That's the one we know and love. Okay. That it is. But I, I'm in an um, Airbnb at the moment, and I realized there are no books on a bookshelf, which is just breaks my heart. So I didn't want anyone to think I was a Philistine. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the counter signal. It's like, what's worth, like, if the highest status thing is a bookshelf of, of books, like a bookshelf with no books is like worse than no bookshelf at all. Um, exactly. uh, okay, good. I just want to make sure you hadn't lost your mark because, you know, for everyone on the call, Village, we hosted this event for some of our luminary LPs and some of these emerging luminaries. And uh, I won't name who on the Village team was involved in event planning, but she had given me a heads up that um, Michael's is, has quite a character and had, is going to bring a distinctive look uh, to the party. And uh, you didn't let us down with the, with your famous hair, Michael. So it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. Um, it's softened a little bit during the pandemic. So um, yeah, I haven't been out partying in a while. So, so, so Mike, so Mike, on a more serious question regarding the Calm app, is there some tension? Uh, we asked this, uh, who are we talking? Oh, Chamath Palamantia. We had um, at a village event for some of our angel investors talking about SPACs. And um, I'm sure you've been pitched by some SPAC uh, sponsors to take a Calm Public. That's and a different are, conversation. Yeah. But, you know, I asked, I asked Chamath, uh, you know, who helped build the original growth team at Facebook and who now rails against Facebook as too bad for the world. I said, you know, is there some moral calculus, like as VCs, if we invest in startups that employ growth hacking techniques and maximize engagement and addiction of the products, is that morally wrong? And his, you know, so your calculus and he, and, and Chamath sort of said, no, it's not wrong. You got, you, you know, you do you and uh, do what's best for you and your own your own sort of understanding of that. 
I'm curious for you and Calm, like how do you look at engagement statistics and viral loops and addictiveness of the product when isn't the whole point of the product and the mission sort of get people off their phones uh, perhaps and more in touch with themselves? So like, is there some world in which if someone's spending like too much time on Calm or clicking too many buttons, you, you tell them to sign off? Yeah, this is a complex question and a, a nuanced one. And um, we believe that it's okay to, to use, you know, gamification and kind of invite loops and all the traditional, um, we don't go super deep on it, but, but traditional Silicon Valley techniques, because what we're doing is we believe healthy. You know, it's, it's not getting someone addicted on gambling or, or something that's gonna damage their mental health. It, it is making them healthier and happier. And your point, you know, the irony is not lost on us that, that we, a lot of the stress and strain in the world is due to phones and pervasive screens and social media. And here we are telling people to use their phone um, to, to become more mindful. And, and the way we answer that is that it, what we're trying to do is empower people to, to give them the tools and the knowledge to work with their technology and their devices for them instead of against them in a mindful way instead of a mindless way. So you don't just whip out your phone and just go through the feeds when you're just bored. Um, you're conscious of when you do it and how you do it. Because these black boxes we've got and this technology and the apps being developed in the Valley are extraordinary, life-changing, magical. But we need to use them, as I say, for us and, and not against us. And a mindful practice can help enormously there. So uh, Jeremiah, uh, would love to, you submitted a question about wellness and healthcare. Um, we'd love to have you unmute yourself. And if anyone else has questions in our last 10 minutes for Michael, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll call on a few of you. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Jeremiah Robison and I'm the founder of Psionic and we build assistive devices for people who have neuromuscular uh, disease or disability. Um, I spent eight years of my career working in the consumer wellness space, sold my last company to Jawbone and they spent a lot of time at that belief that there's a transformation happening in healthcare, much like you've talked about, where we are more conscious of the whole person and that mm -hmm. continuum between fitness, mental wellness. You said mental fitness, which I loved as a concept, into true, tried and true healthcare. What are the efforts you are doing to break down those barriers to really get this into people's lives as a uh, a healthcare solution, um, and what do you see as the future of treating the whole person? Yeah, so um, just a few years ago, mental health, as I mentioned earlier, was you know so stigmatized; it was in the shadows, and, and now it now it is stepping into the light. We've still got a long way to to go there. So one of the things we're doing is building calm, and as I say, making it accessible and simple and relatable. I think one of the key things we've done on the journey, real, real step changes, has been working with celebrities. And I think that that probably felt quite weird to authentic mindfulness community. But if you want to reach billions of people, work with LeBron James or Harry Styles or Matthew McConaughey. They have these platforms and they have these respects. So the fact LeBron James uses Calm opens us up to huge, huge new audiences. And that we took a leaf out of the Nike playbook in, in their early days. They, they did something similar, you know, connecting with celebrities um, to, to help their growth. So that's one thing. And then another is, is to work with healthcare providers. You know, we've, we have a partnership with Kaiser Permanente. The belief is that using a product like Calm is the equivalent of going to the gym uh, for your mind. Um, and, uh, and so what that does is downstream, hopefully reduce uh, mental health interventions, drugs, psych expensive psychologists. But the big thesis, hopefully the trillion dollar opportunity is having a more healthy mind means you might eat more healthily. You might take more exercise. You'll be more conscious and mindful of, of what you do with your body, thus reducing heart disease, diabetes, and, and many, many other physical issues. So we think to your point, body and mind very interconnected and, and it just feels like there's, there's massive opportunity here over the next few years for many different brands and companies. Uh, Car Can I just follow up quickly, Ben, on that? We're just gonna go to another question. Okay, sorry. Next to the question. Car Carlos, um, do you wanna ask about attrition? We've heard about, I have the same question actually on Calm and, and Churn rate, Carlos. Oh yeah, hi, uh, so uh, I'm CEO of Logic Inc. Uh, we make, uh, tattoo-like wearables. And uh, I've used Calm and, and one question I had is, if there's a difference when you are uh, trying to keep customers at an early stage and keeping them with you and making sure that uh, they become repeat customers 
And how does that change as you scale? Because obviously you're so much bigger now. Did you change in any way your strategy? Did you just assume a certain percentage that that's part of it? Or I'm just curious, like really interested in learning your answer. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, I, I love consumer subscription businesses, but, but the danger, the big number you have to watch is, is your churn. <laughs> and so you can't just create content, set it and forget it. You have to constantly be adding to it and improving the product. And we look a lot at Netflix and Spotify, how they are constantly adding new content. So when we were just meditation, people would often um, learn and then churn. And um, the key is to... Um, get someone to stay not just for a year or two, but for their lifetime. And so we've had to be very thoughtful about how can we expand the content that we create so calm is with you through every occasion in your life. You learn meditation with us, you sleep better with us, but then can we create content for first time mums or, or, or pregnant um, folks? Can we help you with weight loss? Can we help you with a fear of flying or giving up smoking or on and on and on? So creating this huge library of, of content for life. So I think that's a, a very important way of, of thinking about um, uh, a long-term library for a subscription business. Do you, do you see uh, Spotify as a competitor, Michael? Yeah, I noticed a few people asking that question. A, a few years ago, I think that would have been, you know, a bit audacious of us to say that. Uh, and now I think we are sort of getting closer to their territory. You know, we, it feels like we're in the, the year of the year, the, the golden age of audio. Uh, there's so much um, going on there. And uh, I would say um, as we get bigger, um, they will become more of a competitor as we fight for, for the same types of content and they move more into the health and wellness space. Because do you have an exclusive relationship with people like LeBron or like could he go and endorse uh, Spotify uh, meditation routine? Well, one, one of the big things we've done with our celebrity deals is, is make sure they're not just us writing a check and then um, in exchange for services. We, we think of them as ICE deals. And for anyone on the call that wants to work with celebrities, this has worked really well for us. So the I stands for investment. Um, we like the celebrity to have a stake in Calm, ideally investing in us. C is for content. They create something unique and evergreen that lives within the app. And the E is for engagement. They have to use the product and be authentic. And by doing that, you create these multi-year, very deep relationships where they talk about us all the time. So he could do something with someone else, but he's, he's got a good you know, stake in calm. He invested LeBron and um, really believes in what we're doing. Have, have you ever talked to John Donahoe, by the way, Michael? No. Is he from CEO, Liberty? C CEO of Nike now. He's a new CEO. Oh, Nike. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we just we did... Because uh, he's a meditator. We actually, me and him were on a meditation retreat together at one point a few years ago. And he was at a village event. He's a friend of the firm. Um, I'm curious if he uses Calm. We'll follow up afterwards because he should, he'd be a great person to be using, <laughs> using the app, obviously. I loved it. John became CEO of Nike and a week later, he posted on LinkedIn a photo of him and LeBron and like Anthony Davis and a bunch of athletes. And I'm like, that's a cool gig when you wear Michael Jordan Jumpman gear as your workwear and just I started immediately hanging out with, uh, you know, the best athletes in the world. Pretty good CEO gig. Um, Rachel, uh, Craig, uh, your frugality question, I, you know, I thought you could ask, yeah, that's fascinating. Michael, you talked about frugality as a value in the early days of Calm, not raising too much money. Rachel, do you want to uh, expand on that? Sure. I can unmute. So great. I mean, I think, um, you know, we run a really lean business at Motion Hall. And so that one kind of resonated with me. And the question I'm always asking myself and now want to ask you is if there are any lessons from frugality that you think were negative, right? I appreciate so many of those lessons are important, but can it ever hold you back? And one of them is, you know, is there ever a reticence to switch over to say, burning money quickly and knowing when you should to achieve a goal or other areas like that, that might, uh, might be a downside to frugality? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And again, it's, it's tricky. It depends the, the space you're in and, and the bets you're making. One, one of my big philosophies as an entrepreneur is you just got to be placing a lot of bets very quickly and learning from those and doubling down on the things that are working. And so if those bets require a little bit of money, not having that money to place them is going to hamstring you and hold you back. So one example, maybe um, we took quite a while to get our user acquisition machine going because we just couldn't, we couldn't afford to take the risk. Losing a few thousand dollars a day on betting and on Facebook ads was was a huge risk for us. So having more cash, having a bit more of a cushion to have lent into that quicker uh, would have been very helpful for us. Um, so again, hard question to answer. It kind of, kind of depends. And again, no harm having a ton of cash in your bank account. You just 
you just don't need to spend it. Be mindful <laughs> about what you do. Have it for a rainy day. Have it for optionality to make acquisitions or, or big bets if you need. But don't fall into the trap of raising money and then thinking, oh, I've got to put that cash to work. But I've if, if you did, but if you do it again, and I guess it's, maybe it's obvious given how successful you've been, but you would have poured more money into Facebook it's a user acquisition earlier in the life of the company, you think? I think we would have probably, we would have started that a little earlier and, and found the magic a little quicker. I think that would have. Um, and yeah. were you waiting, you, were you waiting until you had some sense of product market fit? Like what metric were you looking for to say, ah, we, we've got it time to just pour gasoline on this. Yeah, it was, we hadn't, we'd sort of got product market fit, but we just didn't really have those muscles. We didn't really know what we were doing. So we found an external agency that didn't really work. It was just, there was a lot of, um, we didn't realize quite how important that, that piece of the puzzle was. And um, again, we just didn't have the cash to kind of invest. And what's, invest. what's the, what's your best channel right now? How do you acquire customers? Well, um, other than my, word of mouth and organic, which is obviously the best, but like, are you Instagram, Facebook, fa Facebook and Instagram are the, the two big, the big guns. And, yeah. uh, you know, very grateful for those extraordinary platforms. Um, but, and, and trying to spin up others. So, you know, we've, we've got a brilliant UA team exploring everything from Quora to LinkedIn to, you know, Pinterest. It's, we, we have some success elsewhere, but those, those are the, the big two. And we found what, one, one thing I would mention that, that could be relevant. We, we found a really positive channel in um, quirky PR and uh, just uh, creating very unique stories um, about sto uh, sleep stories, you know, GDPR sleep story or an eight hour movie called Bar Bar Land um, that generated a lot of PR all around the world, hundreds of articles that drove a lot of free organic traffic. So. I love that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you forget about that, especially internet tech oriented entrepreneurs that old school PR can still can still work. Um, I had a quite, we're out of time. I was going to ask what agency you used and how you, a lot of our founders are trying to hire external performance marketing consultants in the early days of their startup because they don't have an in-house UA team, but we'll, we'll make, get some recommendations for you afterwards. Um, well, one thing I'd say is um, Reforge is, is brilliant in, mm -hmm. in the battle. A, a lot of our team have been through, through that. Um, and yeah, we have a fantastic leader, Dan Wang, who, who's built our UA team, joined us very early. But yeah, that, um, that's, that's so important. Michael, we really appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we're honored, Michael, to have you as part of the village and so many Calm users in the village uh, who, who rely on your product to uh, stay grounded and stay connected. So thank you for your contributions uh, mm -hmm. to the world. Um, thanks everyone for being part of us. And uh, on behalf of Anne, Eric, Sheila, the whole team here at Village, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And feel free to, to hit me up on LinkedIn if you've got more questions or, or just want to connect or Acton on Twitter. Um, so, uh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.